everyone doing today? Good. 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 Doing okay. A little bit on the sleepy side, that's pretty normal for me though. Looking forward to this weekend. A um, couple announcements. As a reminder, the Chapter 1 homework and quiz are due tonight. Um, we, covered, we finished covering everything we absolutely needed for that uh, on Tuesday. Um, but there is tonight. We have time to be able to ask some questions. Um, additionally, I will be posting the Chapter 2 homework and quiz to be able to be viewed today. It will not be due until maybe Tuesday after this next one, because we're only just going to start a chapter two. Uh, but it's at least going up so that you can begin looking at it. Uh, but at least for tonight, prioritize the chapter one homework and quiz if you have not already finished those. Um, we do have lab in here today. If you haven't had lab yet this week, um, you can come in. I'll tell you about these things. And let's see. Today we're going to Continue with chapter two. I think we just barely began last time talking about energy laws. And we're going to go into using some math, so using the actual formula for doing second law, for example, talking about weight and how to find it, and etc. So, before we get started, does anyone have any questions about chapter two or say about the homework or the quiz you have? Yes. Problem um, six and eight on the homework. I'll find the need to make this. Okay, so I'll talk about these a little bit. something like this. It's going to travel sideways as it falls down. As it does so, it will be given six different numbers for the amount of drop that this bullet undergoes. Uh, of those six numbers, you're just going to want to average them together to find the average bullet drop. Um, that average will be given to you in centimeters. You're going to want to make sure you convert that to meters before you use it in any way. All the formulas ask for meters. You are also told the horizontal distance that the ball traveled before it gets struck the ground. From these two known pieces of information, you are asked the firing speed of this particular musket. Now, assuming that it's being fired sideways, we are dealing for most of our problems, you're going to be essentially solving for the initial x velocity. Now, you're told, how, you're told the horizontal displacement, you have the tools to find the average for the vertical displacement. Additionally, what would, just to list a couple more things that you do know, if you're firing sideways, what would the initial y velocity be? Very good. What would the x acceleration be in midair? If you are, if, if, if it has been fired sideways, okay. So if the x acceleration is going to be zero. Because gravity will only accelerate in the y-axis. So, you're told a lot of information, well, you can infer a lot of information here that will help. So, this is a standard kind of a projectile motion question, except that this time you've been told the range 
and you're asked to find the firing speed. So, what formula do you think will eventually tell us the firing speed that we want? What formula would be a good option? Okay, third one. Uh, now, if we're, looking, if we're looking at the horizontal firing speed, we need to make sure we are only using the horizontal variables. So this is equation three. Now we know the x acceleration is zero. So this term will go away and that will simplify things a little bit. We want velocity initial x. We know the horizontal displacement. You've been told it. Everyone's number is going to be slightly different, which is why I'm sticking to formulas for right now. But whatever this number is, your problem does tell you what it is. So you do know this. You want vix, but you don't know time. So we're going to need to use something else to tell us the time that the bullet is in the air. Now, in general, what axis determines how long something, how long a projectile will be falling? The y axis. The y axis. Since gravity accelerates things in the y axis, that is the axis that will determine the amount of time available to you. So, now we're going to turn to the same equation, but using y variables to solve for the time that the ball will be in the air. And, conveniently, our initial y speed is zero, which means this term is going to go away, and that will help make things a little bit easier. Now, we need to solve this one for time. We do know delta dy, we can average the bullet drops given to us to find a single delta dy. You're going to want to convert that to meters. You're also going to want to make it negative because it does fall downwards. So your displacement here should be negative and you need to convert it to meters first before you plug it into the formula. Next, this term is gone, plus 1 half times negative 9.8 times time squared. So you're going to use this to solve for time, the formula for which should look something like square root of 2 d delta y So you're going to use this to find time. You're going to plug that time back up here and solve for vix. And just to go ahead and tell you, if you are still finding the numbers, the velocity horizontally is going to be a big number. It's a firearm, it's going to shoot fast. So you're expecting a large velocity here. All right? The time is going to be really tiny. The time is going to be small, but the velocity is going to be big. Okay, now that was number six. This is number eight. Number eight is about a rocket sled, which I cannot draw very well. So that's our poorly drawn rocket. This rocket is going to race across some field. You do know that field's length. Different, the numbers are going to be slightly different for everybody. You are told the length of the field. You are told the acceleration of the rocket. You are told your initial velocity is zero. Then you are asked for three things. The first is the time that it takes for the rocket to go from here to here. The 
second thing is the velocity final at the end of the field. And then the last thing is the velocity halfway down the field. Now, if you're looking for time, you're actually going to use a very similar method to what we use to find time over here. You know how far the rocket's going to go, and you know its acceleration as it does so. It's not accelerating at 9.8, it's got some other number, but you do know its acceleration and how far it's going to travel. So you can use the same method to find the total time required, and that'll give you the first answer. The second and third answers, instead of relying on formula three, you're going to rely on formula four. So formula four says velocity final squared equals velocity initial squared plus QAD. To find the final velocity at the end of the field, the initial velocity is zero. You are told the acceleration of the rocket, and you're told the width of the field. So plugging in the total field width and the acceleration will help you find how fast you'd be moving at the edge of that field. And then for the second part, we are asked, what would it be halfway down the field? You do the same thing, but you plug in half the field distance. That's all you change. So, last time we met, I believe we had introduced these, the laws of motion. These are Newton's laws, very important work done by Sir Isaac, that formed the backbone of how we understood motion in the universe for hundreds of years. And they are still important because they, they work for 99.9% .9 of everything you are physically going to interact with. They only don't work for supermassive objects in space. These will be the golden rules that we judge pretty much all motion by in this class. Now, we talked about this first law and what it means. I'm going to add one more piece of information to it. This law has a name, and that name is the law of inertia. So the first law is called the law of inertia, and that's because this law is describing the concept of inertia. Inertia is a, a property possessed by matter. So, inertia is a property of matter. And if you've ever watched old Bill Nye episodes, the old Bill Nye the Science Guy show, 
Yeah, but in the theme song, like the one, some part of the theme song from the narrator says, inertia is a property of matter. So that's been drilled into my head since the 90s. So, <clears throat> all matter, all objects made of particles have inertia, and this is inertia. Inertia is an object's tendency to stay at rest or stay at constant velocity until acted upon by an outside force. That is just that is the definition of inertia. That's why this is the law of inertia. It is describing that concept. So every single object on my desk right now is at rest and it's going to stay that way until something outside of itself exerts a force on it and makes a change. The first law is very straightforward. We will refer back to it periodically because it's important for understanding an object that is moving at constant velocity as in, without accelerating. But now we're going to talk about the second law. This is going to get into the math that we're going to be using in this today and next week. So, the second law is sigma f, sum of all forces on an object, is equal to the mass of that object times its acceleration. I believe I mentioned before, like my Taekwondo instructor said, if you want to punch something harder with more force, you will either need to move your fist faster, or you will need a bigger fist. What this law says is, to make any object accelerate, you need to exert a force on it. If I never touch that tape dispenser again, if no one touches that tape dispenser again, it's just going to stay there. You need to use a force to make it change. Now, you've been using force your whole life, you've been measuring force your whole life, but now we're going to start doing it the metric way. So, the definition of force is a push or a pull that creates an acceleration in an object with mass. So when you, when you push or pull or lift or tug or throw, you are utilizing force. Let the Star Wars jokes commence. And a uh, variable for force in all our formulas is just going to be a capital F. It's very straightforward. And I drew this little arrow on top of this F, and there's the line under the F in the board equation. What does that represent about force as a concept? It's a vector. It's a vector. Force is a vector because you, if you push anything, it has to be in a direction. You cannot apply directionless force. That's not a thing. Now, conveniently, Force is a vector and acceleration is a vector. Mass is not. It's mass is directionless. You can't have five grams up. But force and acceleration are. And both of these vectors in this equation will point in the same direction. If I push something up, it will accelerate up. Gravity pulls down, it causes objects to accelerate down. So whatever direction one of them has, so will the other. Now, in the metric system, we're going to measure force in units of newtons. Sir Isaac's work was so important, we named the unit after him. Now, we don't use newtons very often in the United States. What is the imperial unit of force? Gravity is a force, but what can we measure it in? That's a velocity. The force of gravity does cause things to accelerate. That acceleration would be negative 9.8. There we go, pounds. The imperial unit of force is pounds. Your weight is the force of gravity on your body. And there are scientists 
sports scientists who measure like the the swing speed of a batter or the punching force of a boxer, usually they will measure those variables in pounds, like the, the pounds that someone is able to punch. Pounds is a measure of force, so whenever you weigh anything, you're just measuring the force of gravity on that object. So the imperial unit of force is pounds, but we are going to be working with newtons in the metric system, but you can convert between the two. Last but not least, one newton is defined as one kilogram times one meter per second squared. If I was to take a one kilogram object and make it accelerate at one meter per second squared, that would take one newton of force to pull off. That's just the definition of the unit, and we get that from the formula. The thing to note is, though, it's specifically one kilogram times meter per second squared. Not one gram, one kilogram. That means any mass you plug into this formula has to be in units of kilograms. You do have to convert it first. The only reason we really do this is because using kilograms instead of grams makes all of our numbers smaller and more manageable. Using kilograms to define newtons, I have a weight of 1,000 newtons. But if you used grams instead, suddenly I would have a weight of 1 million newtons, which is a big scary number. So we use kilograms to just keep the numbers smaller. That's all, that's the only reason. And if you plug grams in, I'm not gonna make a huge deal about it on like a test score or anything, but Gram, kilograms is the correct measure. It'll be the most accurate for you know, every step of the equation afterwards. Now, the sigma on front of the force is very important. Let's look at this tape dispenser sitting on my desk real quick. What we're going to do is we're going to draw what's called a force body diagram, or a free body diagram, showing the forces acting on that tape dispenser. And a free body diagram is just a very fancy way of saying, I'm going to draw a box that represents the tape dispenser, and we're going to put arrows on it to tell us what the forces are. So we're just going to draw arrows representing the force on that tape dispenser. This tape dispenser is an object with mass, it has some amount of mass, and there are going to be forces acting on it. So, what's the first force you think of acting on the tape dispenser right now? Gravity. Gravity, very good. This object is on planet Earth. Gravity is going to be there. So, there's a force of gravity acting on its mass. It should be accelerating due to that force. Is it currently accelerating? No. Why? Table is pushing up with a different, with an equal but opposite force. Oops. I've labeled the force of gravity as F with a subscript G. This is the variable we usually reserve for force of gravity. It's the same thing as weight. I have called the force from the table for, uh, F with a subscript N. This stands for normal force, which we'll talk more about later. Right now, just know that the force that the table is exerting up on the tape is called a normal force. That's just what it, the type of force that it is. And since the acceleration of this tape dispenser is zero, Whatever its mass is, zero times mass tells us that the net force, not the individual forces, but the net force, the sum of all the forces, has to be zero. This object is not accelerating, which means every force on it has to be balanced. So that sigma f, it represents the sum of all forces. I might call that net force, I might call that total force. It just means every force on it right now has to be balanced. They're adding up to zero. And that's what's keeping it 
in its constant state. The inertia of the tape dispenser is telling it to stay still, and it's allowed to stay still because the force is on the balance and there's no net acceleration. So balance forces allow the object to stay as it is. That means the object can stay still, but that also means it can move at constant velocity. When you turn on the cruise control in your car, the whole point of the cruise control is you set it, the car keeps moving at the same velocity, and you can take your foot off the gas. For your car to continuously move forwards at the same velocity, When you're driving, if you take your foot off the gas and cruise control isn't on, what's going to happen? You slow down. Why? Friction. Friction. Very good. So normally, when the gas of the car just isn't on, friction will eventually slow you down. Friction is an outside force that causes you to accelerate and slow down. It causes you to decelerate. When you turn on cruise control, the engine of the car, the computer in it, causes the engine to exert just enough force forwards to cancel out friction. So that friction and the force from the engine cancel out, and you're allowed to keep moving at constant velocity. You're not accelerating, you're moving forwards at the same speed. So, if acceleration is zero, net force is zero, and that means Whatever the object is doing, it's just going to keep doing it. Now, the last one of Newton's three laws of motion. For every action force, there is an equal and opposite reaction force. You've all witnessed this before in the past. If I exert a force upwards on these markers, the markers are going to push back down into my hand. That's why I can feel their weight. And if I add more markers, I feel more force because I have to lift up harder on more weight, and they're going to push down harder into my hand as a result. Every single force you exert, the object in question will exert the same amount of force back without fail. When I lean against this wall, I'm exerting a force into the wall, and conversely, the wall exerts a force back on me. If the wall was not doing that, what would happen to me in this posture? I would fall. Right now the force from the wall is balancing out everything else and keeping me still. If that force just stops, I fall. Every single object does this, even if you don't really feel it or notice it. It's especially apparent if you, like I said with my Taekwondo instructor, if you don't push, if you don't have a big enough fist or you don't punch hard enough and you try to punch a board, it's going to hurt. Because if you exert a force on it, it will exert a force back on you. And if force is exerted on a human body, you're going to feel it. So, we'll refer back more to this later. Right now I want to go ahead and start using the second law to begin calculating some stuff. Um, before we do that, though, any questions? Okay. Um, we're about halfway through lecture. I think we need a stream of water or anything. I'm thirsty, so I'm going to go ahead and take a break. It felt really warm when I walked the campus today, so say hi to everybody.
going to go ahead and put it up on the board so you can start copying things down. So this is going to be our first force example. Uh, the way I, this picture is drawn, we're going to kind of be looking down from a bird's eye view onto a four-way tug-of-war match, essentially. So looking down from above, we have a 500 gram object, and there are four forces acting on this object, one in each cardinal direction. Now this does mean that this is a two-dimensional problem, because we're looking at forces in the x-axis and the y-axis. It is it's important to define you know, positive and negative in each axis. I, for most of the examples I'm going to work with you guys, I'm going to stick with the assumption that the right is positive x and up is positive y. So that's how I'm going to be writing the signs for this. That's how I'm going to try to write them for the entire class. Looking at this diagram, the very first thing we are asked for is the total force on the object. So, we're asked for sum of all forces. Take that out. Now, would you say we're trying to just add all four of these numbers together? No. Why? Right. They're all in different directions, and some of them are working against one another. So we have to add them one. We have to separate them into their respective axes, and we have to factor in the direction. So, start with the x axis. So, Yes, very good. So, we're looking at our x-axis forces first. We have 250 to the right, 200 to the left. Why is, why can we not just add them like this? Because we're working against each other. We're working against each other. We have defined the left words as negative x, so that has to be negative 200. You could switch which one is you could write it negative 200 plus 250. It doesn't really matter which one you list first, as long as your directions and your signs are consistent. So, if right is positive, make sure the rightward one has a positive number, regardless of what position it's in. And that's going to tell us that the net force in the x-axis is going to be 50 newtons. So just the x component of the net force. Now we're going to look at the y axis. In the y axis, we have 100 pointed up and 125 pointed down. We give us a net force in the y axis of negative 25 newtons. And that is, a, that is our answer. We now know the amount of force on this object within each axis. 50 left and 25 down. Uh, you could keep your answers like this, separated. You could write them like a coordinate system if you wanted to. You don't necessarily have to. Either answer would be acceptable when I agree it. But that is, the, that is the first part done. You have found the total force on the object in each axis. The next thing we're asked for is the total acceleration of the object. Now, we know the force in each axis, we know the mass, so we can calculate the acceleration. So, within the x axis, we have a net force of 50. A mass of 500 grams. Are we set to solve for A now? You do. Very good. So 500 grams is going to be 0.5 kilograms. That's going to leave us with an ex 
acceleration in the x-axis of 100 meters per second squared and we'll do the same thing in the y-axis negative 25 will be equal to 0 0.500 times a y a y in this case should be negative 50 meters per second squared Again, those are the x and y components of our 2D acceleration. And with that, we've solved the question. We have found the acceleration, which happens to be in two axes at once. You could also list that as a coordinate pair if you wanted to. But we finished the question. Now, with, yes, sorry. It's not really a question, it's just, it's hard for me to see the red. Oh, the red? Yeah. Oh, okay. Is it because the, bird, the board is dirty or just because I have a hard time seeing red anyways? My apologies, the board is a little dirty. I can see So, we successfully examined force on this object and acceleration for this object. Very good. So, any questions about that? this and looking at the numbers we got, what direction is this box going to start moving in? So, Alright, it's going to accelerate right and down at the same time, so it's going to kind of slide uh, east, southeast. We're going to find a certain green for it at some point? No, I have not been, for this class I have not been asking for trig, I have not been asking for trig. That's because it's 15 on there, you have to feel like doing that. Okay. So, we've been, we calculated forces. It's time to start talking about some of the technicalities behind a very important force, meaning gravity. It works with gravity a little bit as an acceleration, but Technically speaking, gravity is a force that causes an acceleration. So, when the Earth exerts gravity on your body, the Earth isn't caring about, the, the, the Earth is exerting a force. And that force of gravity is your weight. The weight, I have this up a second now. Force 
of gravity. The tender reserve F with the subscript G to refer to that. Weight is the force of gravity, that is its definition. And your weight depends on your mass and I'm pointing. So, yes, this is the same formula as F equals MA. It's just to specifically find force of gravity, you use the acceleration of gravity. And so this tells you weight. This is the force that gravity pulls down. This is also subsequently the force that you would have to exert to lift an object straight up. To hold something in your hand, you have to be exerting a force equal and opposite to its weight. So this formula, this formula will tell you what something weighs. It also tells you what you need to do to lift it. Now, the force of gravity is different to the acceleration of gravity. That acceleration, which we have a, a specific unit for is g, not even a variable. So lowercase g always means this number. This is not weight. This is the acceleration of gravity. Earth's gravity will pull on every single object with a different force that different force will depend on the object's mass. So all objects are going to weigh differently depending on their mass. But the force will always be enough to cause all of those objects to have the same acceleration. So different objects weigh different amounts so that acting on their different masses, they will have the same g. So. This is not weight, this is acceleration. Weight is m times that number. There's only one time where weight will be the number 9.8. And that's if you're finding the weight of a one kilogram object. Because if you did that, the g equals one times a 9.8. You get an answer of the weight being negative 9.8, but this is force, the answer would be the Newton's. So 9.8 meters per second squared with that unit will never be weight. Okay? I've seen some issues with this arise over time, so I'm just trying to address as many of them as I can at the beginning. So make them the distinction. situation that involves acceleration and weight as separate concepts, the net force and the weight as different things. Any, do you have any questions before we work another example about gravity or anything else? Okay. So, here's our next example. A 100 kilogram crate is suspended in midair. I'm going to erase this previous example and put a new one. in mid-air. So, 
from that, from the second half of that sentence, suspended in midair, we can already go ahead and assume a couple of more pieces of information. Problem only lists one number, but there's other things we can go ahead and assume. Suspended in midair implies what about its movement? It's stationary. And I wrote the question, I'm going to go ahead and guarantee to you, we're talking about a stationary box. It's just hanging there by a line. That means say it one more time. Very good. You're getting ahead of me. It's a good sign. So our initial velocity is zero. What is our acceleration? Just outright acceleration of the box if it's suspended, stationary, and better. Zero. It's not moving, it's not accelerating. That said, what is the acceleration due to gravity acting on this object? Right. It's not actively accelerating, but the constant of g still exists. It's not accelerating at this rate presently, but G is still there. The force of gravity exists even if it's not actively falling. So, the first thing we're actually asked is, what is the force of gravity acting on the crate? So, no mass, no G, we want force of gravity, what can we do to get to that answer? Right, okay. So, this version of the of Newton's second law is dedicated to finding weight from mass and from 9.8. So, we can just find the force of gravity from this formula. So, Fg can be equal to mass times 9.8. 9.8. So our final answer should be negative 980 newtons. Negative just means downwards. And that is the weight of the box. The box is not actively falling, but it still has a weight.
That means you plug in what we already found for force of gravity. You have negative eight, negative 980 plus the force of the row is equal to zero. That means that the force in the row has to be positive 980. Your, your intuition was good, and this is mathematically how we proved what you were just feeling, what you were intuiting. change and repurpose what I have on the board. Don't erase anything. I'm just going to change what's up here for space's sake. I'm going to give like sort of the part B to this example. I'm going to change it slightly. This same crate is still hanging from a rope, but the crane operator pulls the lever and then the crane start increases the amount of force it's pulling up on the box so that it now starts accelerating upwards. So same basic setup, but now the crane is moving the box upwards. The box is now presently moving. Higher. Now, last question. Last 
in the previous version, the net force was zero. In this version, what is the net force? A little louder. 50. 50. Very good. We can determine that one of two ways. One, we can just add these together, and that'll give us 50 again. But we can also do some of the all forces equals mass times acceleration. 100 times 0.5 is 50. So either way you do it, the net force is still 50. And because there is a net force, there is an acceleration. That's why the box is now beginning to move. Pretty much every mechanics question that we are going to look at will come into one of two categories. Either the forces in the system are balanced or they're not. First version, forces are balanced. Second version, they're not. There are engineers and physicists who spend their entire careers analyzing just one of those two situations. There's an entire branch of science dedicated to making sure the net force on something equals zero. And that branch of science is called architecture. If you're building a building, you want the net force on that building to be zero so that no part of the building is accelerating. Because if a piece of the building is accelerating, that probably means it's falling apart. So. An entire architect's job is making sure sum of all forces equals zero. Making the building look pretty is what comes next. Then there's also um, scientists whose entire job is looking at things in motion. Their job is looking at making sure everything works when forces are in balance and that they don't explode or fly away. The examples that we started with here are very simple, but again, there's entire careers that have spun out of either version. So, once again, any questions? We're making a very good time today. Now, I actually don't want to cover too much more today because I figure I want to give you enough to digest. The next topic is somewhat, involves another measure. So we've covered the basic introduction of force. And next thing we're going to do is utilize force, talk about a different principle, sort of the next step along. And I kind of just want to leave it off right about here so that you just have this nice digestible chunk and we can we'll start utilizing it for the next concept next week. I do at least want to tease it a little bit. So last new slide, last piece of information before we call it in, for the weekend. Um, force is defined as a push or a pull that causes an object to accelerate. Now usually the point of exerting a force is to cause an object to accelerate. Your goal in pushing something is to make it accelerate. When you get in your car and you hit the gas, you want the engine to exert a force to make the car go forwards. When Hulk jumps in front of a train and pushes against the train to slow it down, the goal is use force, make train accelerate, make train's velocity become smaller. The point of force is to make objects change their path, move, etc. What we're going to be analyzing next is sort of the, the energy and the mechanics that go into the motion. What I want to leave you on though is it is possible to exert a force and have nothing happen. If I push against this wall, me as a human against a layer of cinder block, 
Am I gonna accomplish anything? No. I'm going to exert force. I'm gonna be trying to do something, but I'm not actually gonna get anything done. I won't accomplish anything. I'm not gonna do any work. We exert force to make objects change their motion, and as we do that, the sort of measure of how much we accomplish with that force, whether or not the force is actually having an effect, because again, I can exert a force that has no effect. The measure of the effectiveness is going to be what we're going to talk about next time is work. So. We're going to begin examining the physics definition of work and how you calculate it using force. Um, the last thing I want to just talk about though is, oh, I'm leaving handprints all over the floor. I? I end up using my fingers as an eraser because I keep losing the eraser and I usually just have to fix one mistake. So I'd forgotten over the summer the issues coming home with completely dry erased fingers and the issues that come up when I'm cooking and I taste something that I'm cooking and all of a sudden all I taste is marker. Problems you only have when you're a teacher. Um, last thing, when I'm exerting this force on the wall, I am doing, there is a force present, but why is the wall not accelerating? Push it back. Yes. The wall does push back on me, but that is a force on me, not a force on the wall. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, third law of pairs, Newton's third law. When I exert a force on the wall, the wall exerts a force back on me, but that reaction force does not mean I stop pushing on the wall. I'm still putting a force into the wall. The wall pushing on me does not negate that fact there's still a force on the wall that something else has to balance out. So, what is stopping me from pushing the wall over right now? Okay, good. You are right. The wall has a huge amount of mass. And based on this formula, my tiny human arm force against the huge mass of a building is going to create a very tiny acceleration. Me pushing on this wall, it's, it's too big for my puny not hulk muscles to do much of anything. Additionally, this wall is also stuck to parts of the ceiling and parts of the floor that are going to exert forces, frictional forces, to keep the wall from going anywhere. So there's other forces outside of the wall holding it in place when I do this. And the reaction force of the wall pressing on me does not mean the force I'm exerting just stops. It's still there and something else has to balance it. Okay. Any questions? Okay. I will leave you with that to digest over the weekend. Finish the chapter one homework and quiz tonight. Do begin looking at the chapter one, at the chapter two assignments. The sooner you begin them, the easier it will be to resume them. So once you finish with one, at least glance at two. And if you have a Thursday lab, I'll see you today. If not, I'll see you next week. Have a wonderful weekend.